Hi everyone and welcome to the NG Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Einstein. In the NG Podcast, we aim to bring you content that's of interest to anyone involved in enteral feeding, whether you're a healthcare professional, a patient or a carer. We hope you enjoy the NG Podcast and if you do, please subscribe or like or both on whichever platform you're viewing or listening to it on. I'm joined today by Von Clarkson, who's one of the nutrition nurse team at Preston Hospital in the northwest of England. So uh, thanks, Yvonne, for taking the time out of your busy schedule today to join us. We really appreciate you uh, supporting this inaugural NG podcast. And before we start talking about the subject of today's um, conversation, the uh, NG pod healthy human volunteer trial just so people have some context could you just uh, tell us how long you've been a nutrition nurse and now i've been a nutrition nurse for just over 12 years wow there's probably not that many people who can claim that and (laughs) and so you've kind of stuck with it so i'm assuming there's some things you like about it what are the things you you enjoy the most about being a nutrition nurse I think mostly it's um, working autonomously and making decisions. But although that has its its good points, and I love that, it also means that I'm more accountable for my decision making, and that can be that can be challenging at times, yeah. particularly when you're um, when you disagree with people and to actually try and make them see different viewpoints. Sure. Sure. Uh, uh, some aspects of that around sort of patient advocacy as well. Yeah, and th- things like the the ethics of of the decision making around um, clinical nutrition. It's become from from a simple thing twelve years ago. It's now become more and more complex, yeah. and the decision making around it has to be extremely detailed mm. Mm. it's interesting to see how how that's developed over time and, and i think one of the things that's always struck me about nutrition nurse teams around the country is that the number of nutrition nurses that work in a hospital across the uk varies massively between organizations there are still some hospitals that don't have nutrition nurses. So just again, from the point of view of context, um, what does the nutrition nurse team look like in Preston uh, and and how how has it evolved into its current form? Um, Initially, when I joined, um, there were, I made up number three and now there are seven of us. Um, I will leave Tracy early she's taking um, a step back and doing other things. So she's still part of the nutrition service, but um, that's only on a on more of a part-time now. Sure. There's, including Tracy, there's seven of us in the team, so it is quite an extensive team, but we don't yeah. just cover enteral nutrition, we cover parental nutrition as well. And okay. we have our community um, home TPN patients that we monitor as well. Okay. So and we, really and we have a rapid access clinic for people to come in and get tube and, and TPN issues sorted. And then okay, and how, how, often do, how often does that run? Every day. On a weekend, wow. on a weekend, we have a weekend service. And on a weekend, although there's only one nutrition nurse on duty, if anyone in the community has a problem, we bring them into A&E. Sorry, it's called emergency department now. Yeah. Uh, we bring them in and sort them out, sort out the problem, and then send them back home from A and E. So it's still the same rapid access yeah. service, but it's just at a different location at the weekend because of the lone worker aspects of it. Sure, and, and again, I think that's a relatively unusual service, even to have nutrition nurses available um, all week. 
is mm. is quite is quite a big step for a hospital. And I have to say, you know, congratulations to uh, to you guys for uh, managing to get a service seven days a week because I'm sure it must make a massive difference to patients being able just to come in and sort problems out. Um, you know, seven days a week. Mm. Yeah, it does. That's fantastic. Well. Um, before we, we we said we were going to talk uh, mainly about the Healthy Human Volunteer trial. Um, so before we ask you some questions around that, we thought we would refresh your memory of the day uh, with a short video. Wonder how many of these people would volunteer again if we asked them? <laughs> um, possibly none. <laughs> there was another one of ours. Honestly, he never shuts up at the best of times. Lovely. <laughs> Hopefully that's refreshed your, your memory of the day. And um, I, that was uh, back in, in March 2019. And um, yeah. I guess one of the things that um, uh, you can probably claim now, having done that 37 placements in a day that day and I've recently done the NG pod clinical trial in patients um is you probably used NG pod more than any other person in the world um so I guess <laughs> the, well, today we we are talking about the healthy human volunteers trial um yeah. how did it feel placing one 37 NG tubes in one day and two doing that on friends and colleagues from your trust instead of patients? Well, firstly, I was only going over to take the equipment over. <laughs> That's number one. And then, okay, all oh, right, oh yeah, I'll, fine, I'll place a few NG tubes, not a problem. And then I think I asked, it might have been Rosemary, it, it uh, might have been somebody else, oh, how many are you planning to pass? 10 or 12 was the response I got. And um, then as the, as the hours progressed, <laughs> um, it began to feel like one of those uh, Milgram experiments. In the yeah. interest of science, you must continue. <laughs> <laughs> we have, oh, we just have a few more lining up. Are you OK to carry on? Yes. <laughs> but the, the bench was not at a good height, so no. my back filled me at the end of the day. But passing it on colleagues, I think the last one of the day was a consultant surgeon, um, a GI consultant. So he actually was having a 10 French NG tube pass, which are the nice comfy ones, um, not a Riles tube. And he's used to ordering Riles tubes for his patients. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, sort of like size 14 or 16. And he actually said he has more respect for his patients now that they have to tolerate these tubes. So that was good. And one of the dietitians, um, I don't know how she did it, but she kept the tube in and went to have a lunch and ate her lunch with it in as wow. well. And she wanted to do that to know what it was like from the patient's perspective. So, you know, full credit to her because I have had an NG tube. And that yeah. benefit of placing them on the day meant that nobody came near my nose with a tube. Yeah, so that yeah, was yeah. A good thing. That was a good yeah, thing. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it, so it was often uh, you that gets them, and it always used to be uh, Thelma, who's now retired, I think, um, was uh, was always volunteered for a um, for an NG tube, and often a bridal, I think, as well. Yeah. So I've yeah, had, well, it's, I've had one NG tube pass on me. And I had a bilateral nosebleed, so never again. <laughs> that, that in fact, is what happened to me the one time Tracy tried to put an NG tube down on me. Mm. Um, but 
that's a story for another day. So um, when you look at um, the difference between um, putting an NG tube in in the environment you're in, aside from the fact that you you, you can put a patient's bed height up and you mm. couldn't do that on the day. What what were the, the biggest differences you noticed uh, between uh, inserting a tube on a healthy volunteer versus inserting one on a patient? Um, they were all extremely cooperative. They knew what was <laughs> they knew what was coming, whereas patients, although they know what's coming and we've explained it beforehand, when you actually put the tip of the tube in the nose, their natural reaction is to move back out the way and move their head back. And nobody seems to do that, which was quite unusual. Yeah, yeah. Because they had given consent and they knew what they were coming to do and they were healthy volunteers, they were actually quite prepared for anything, which yeah. our patients aren't because they've got things wrong with them, which is why they need the tubes in the first place. So that was significant. Yeah. Yeah. But in terms of... Um, in my whole, I mean, 12 years as a nutrition nurse and more years as a qualified nurse placing NG tubes, the worst nose I have ever come across was my colleague Jess. <laughs> You're going to. Yes, it was a complete nightmare. It was the worst tube ever. And, and, and coincidentally, what we're hoping to do is, is obviously to get Jess to talk about her experience on the day. So that'll be that'll be really interesting. Well, I guess um, you've already talked about um, one consultant who obviously um, learned a lot about what it's like to, for, for his patients um, by having the NG tube down. Was there any other uh, interesting feedback from the participants on the day? Um, that informs your practice going forward? I think, because um, we did have quite a few dietitians and speech and language therapists that had it, and I think um, their idea of advocating NG tubes for patients was that they went in with a magic wand and were completely comfortable with no issues whatsoever, um, no, you know, uh, crooked noses or anything. It all went smoothly. That was... Yeah. And now they realise, no, it's not. And it is an uncomfortable procedure. It may not be as bad once the tube's in, yeah. but having that tube placed is awful. And that's yeah. the stance that I always come at when I'm coming to my patients. Look, it's not so bad once it's in, but having it put in is very uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. And do you, do you think that's a really important thing to share with patients, you know, where they can understand that explanation do you think it's really important to do that with them yes because having anything put up your nose it could it's going to make your eyes water it could start making you cough and if you're not aware that it's going to be uncomfortable then you're what are you going to be thinking you're thinking something's yeah. going horribly wrong so they need to know that it can be uncomfortable and that you can pause along the way but that's that's something that's common to my practice. It wasn't, you know, yeah. from sort of doing the, the uh, healthy volunteers. Yeah, yeah. So so um, on the day, it sounds like there was a number of the people who volunteered that got really valuable experiential learning from it. Yes, yeah. It hasn't stopped them advocating tubes, but no. they. I think they're, they're a bit more conscious of the fact that it's, that they don't go in with a magic wand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I'm sure that will be valuable for them uh, going forward. Um, I said at the beginning that uh, you've probably uh, used NG Pod more than anyone else. Um, was there anything on that day that surprised you about the difference between testing for NG tube position with NG Pod versus aspirate and pH strips? Um, it was certainly a lot quicker um, and uh, a lot cleaner. Okay. Um, although, you know, on, on the day, um, we didn't have problems getting aspirate on the healthy volunteers. I mean, that, yeah. it, it doesn't usually run as smoothly as that. Um, yeah. 
so so actually the ones that if we'd have had difficulty getting aspera then you know the ng pod would have been would have been far superior mm. and it was i think the simplicity of it as well is uh, and um on the on the day you can you can just there's no it's either yes it's in no it's not there's no in between and that's yeah. that's the good thing about it okay that's great i mean like, like you said i guess one of the biggest uh, issues in patients is getting the aspirin and 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 obviously you recently part of the team that completed the uh, the uh, the patient clinical trials we we're, we're not we're not ready to talk about that yet on the basis that um we, we want to get that published, but uh, it'll be really interesting to have you back on again uh, <laughs> to, to, to talk about that when, when we can. So um, thank you very much for, for participating today. We really appreciate you taking the time out. So thanks, <laughs> Yvonne, and, uh, and have a good rest of your day. OK, thank you. We'd like to make really clear is that unless explicitly stated, the views expressed in the NG podcast are those of the individuals and not those of NG Pod Global or of the organisations for whom the participants work.